Okay, welcome back after your Easter break. And so in today's lesson, we're going to run through the exam questions you had to go at last lesson. What I didn't say, and I should have said, is these next few packs of exam questions I'm setting you, you don't have to do them under test conditions. So don't worry if you've done that this time, but for the next couple of lessons, when I set these sorts of questions, I'm more than happy for you to use your revision guides or Padlet or um, whatever to, um, to answer the questions. It's more about giving you some practice of the sort of questions you'll get in the exam. Okay, so let's start. So, is it now possible to clone humans? It is, sorry, it is now possible to clone humans. The diagram shows one way in which this can be done. So I've got a body cell from the human that I would like to clone. Um, so it could be skin, hair, muscle, etc. An egg cell, and I've removed the nucleus of the egg cell. So the egg cell could come from anybody. I then put the nucleus of the body cell into the egg cell, and then I end up with a cloned embryo. They haven't put in there the electric shock, have they? Um, and I end up then with taking that cloned embryo and, and it becoming a cloned baby. So what type of reproduction is this? It is asexual reproduction. There weren't two partners. And will the baby have the characteristics of the egg cell or the body cell and explain? This is only worth two marks. So the marks here are going to be for the explanation, not for my answer here. <coughs> Although if I got that answer wrong, obviously, um, then I would be writing the wrong thing here. But anyway, so the baby would have the characteristics of the body cell. And so I need, need to explain why. And for one mark, I'd say because the nucleus that is used is from the body cell um, or I could say alternatively that the nucleus from the egg cell have been removed and then crucially it's the nucleus that contains the DNA or genes or you could say genetic information. Okay, the procedure in the diagram could be used to produce several cloned embryos. How? Well, you can see here that I have, um, at the beginning of the formation of the embryo, I have several cells. So therefore, I could split those apart. Um, so I could split apart that cloned embryo or the cells in the cloned embryo. Okay, question two. So I've got some cells from the root of an onion plant. An X and Y have just been produced by cell division. What sort of cell division? Well, it can't be meiosis because these are not gametes. They're in the root of an onion. So therefore, it must be mitosis. What happens to the genetic material before the cell divides? Well, that's that first stage in mitosis, isn't it, where it's copied or replicated. Um, a gardener would like to produce a new variety of onion. Why does se could sexual reproduction produce a new variety of onion? So the first thing about sexual reproduction is you have fertilisation or fusion of gametes, which is the same, which is what fertilisation is. And that leads to the mixing of genes or DNA or genetic material. And you get one copy of each gene or one allele from each parent. Or you could just use the word meiosis. It got left behind there, didn't it? Okay, question three. I have a drawing showing some fossils found in the layer of rocks. Um, two cliffs on opposite sides of a valley. Geologists think the valley has been carved out by a river um, and therefore the, the, the order of rock on this side is the same as the order on this side. Which of the rock layers A, B, C or D is the oldest? Well, obviously layers form on top of one another. So therefore D, the, the furthest down in the valley, is the oldest layer of rock. Two layers of rock on opposite sides that are the same age. Well, I can see the same fossils in D and Y. So therefore C and X would equally get the mark or B and W would also get the mark. How do fossils provide evidence for the theory of evolution? Well, I could say that fossils 
are evidence of animals or plants that no longer exist. So they provide evidence that um, there were previous plants and animals that don't exist anymore. And similar fossils are found in rocks of a similar age. Um, could be a, a different way of putting that, a different, a, a different way to get those marks. Doctors give antibiotics to patients to kill <coughs> bacteria in their bodies. Explain how the overuse of antibiotics has led to evolution of antibiotic resistant bacteria. Um, I ignore anything about putting good English sensible order because I know that the markers don't actually give me marks for that. But I always try to make sure that answers are logically sequenced anyway. So how do I end up with the evolution of an antibiotic resistant bacteria? So the first thing that's going to happen is mutation, a mutation in the bacteria. Now, which will cause the bacteria to be resistant to the antibiotic. It's really important that that doesn't, you don't say that the antibiotic causes the mutation. It's not the antibiotic causing the mutation. The mutation just happens naturally. It's happening all the time. So there is just a general mutation in the bacteria which causes it to be antibiotic resistant. Then only those resistant bacteria can survive or you could say that those that are not resistant will die. So therefore, those resistant bacteria are the ones that will reproduce and pass on the gene or mutation. Okay, cystic fibrosis. Inherited disease causing the tube of the lungs to be blocked with a sticky mucus. Two parents who do not have the disease can produce a child that has the disease. Explain how the children can inherit the disease from the parents, from those um, who don't have it. You can use a genetic diagram if you want to. Um, so you could either list this out in words. So you could say the first thing that we need to point out is that cystic fibrosis is caused by a recessive gene or you could say recessive allele um, so therefore both the parents if they were able to have a child with cystic fibrosis must have been heterozygous and therefore for the last two marks three and four the offspring needs two recessives to have the disease or I strongly suspect an awful lot of you actually have just done a, a genetic cross for this so for the first mark you still need to point out that it's caused by a recessive gene you have to just write that that's somewhere in this answer um, otherwise it's not clear how you're going to show um, that in a diagram but then you would get a mark for I'm going to use N's instead of C's just to make it easier for to see under the uh, visualizer what I'm doing. So you could show two heterozygous parents, N, 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 like so, and do your cross. So you would get the first mark for the recessive gene, the second mark for having two heterozygous parents. Rather than writing it, you've shown it on the cross. And then the third and fourth marks, again, are for pointing out that this is the child that has cystic fibrosis. So you could then, then clearly showing that it's the one with the two recessive genes that has cystic fibrosis. So mucus contains protein. The information for the production of the protein is stored in a gene. Explain how a change in a gene causes a different protein to be produced. So a change in a gene, you need to point out, is a change in the DNA sequence or the DNA code. This change in that code, therefore, changes the instruction. So I need something that tells me, you know, the code is an instruction to make a protein. And somewhere in there, 
that needs to be made clear that it will be a change in the amino acid sequence that is caused and therefore a change in the protein. Question six. So, <coughs> sex cells are produced by meiosis. Hang on, let me find my answer. Here we go. <coughs> Sorry. Sex cells are produced by meiosis. Describe what happens to the chromosomes when the cell divides by meiosis. So meiosis, first of all, we have the chromosomes are copied. Of course, because the first part is just the same as mitosis. Um, I can have any two of the ones I'm just about to list here. Um, in meiosis, we have the cells dividing twice rather than just once in mitosis. And the other thing that is particular about meiosis is the chromosome number is halved. We end up with cells with half the chromosome number or worse that effect. So any two of those would get you the marks. Darwin's theory of natural selection depends on the fact that individual organisms within a species may share a wide range of variation. Explain how meiosis and sexual reproduction give rise to variation. So in sexual reproduction we have fertilization so we have the gametes or sex cells fusing and therefore the offspring get different genes or you could say alleles or chromosomes from each parent um, Mutation may also give rise to variation. What is meant by mutation? So mutation is a change in a gene. Are all mutations harmful? Well, no, clearly they're not. I'm explaining the reason for my answer. So I'm going to write no, but I know that it's not necessarily going to get me a mark. Well, it just won't get me a mark. They're looking for the explanation here. So I could either say um, any two of these. So I could either go for the some are neutral or some don't have an effect and I could give an example of that. So something like for example the one we looked at where you get an extra digit that's a, a neutral um, mutation. So that'll get me the two marks. I've said some are neutral and I've given an example. Or I could also say that some actually increase the chance of survival. So things like antibiotic resistance, resistance to disease, things like that. Um, so either of those I could use um, as my explanation. <coughs> so for many years, scientists studied the organisms in an area of grassland. One of the animals were the species of black fly, one allele existed for colour. So there was only one allele. So all the flies were homozygous double B. Capital. A mutation occurred. So there was a new recessive allele that could produce a green colour. Draw two genetic diagrams to show how the single B allele in just one fly was able to produce homozygous green flies in two generations. So my first generation, I've got a normal fly and one that has one mutation. So I have produced some heterozygous flies. I get two marks for that genetic cross. Then for the next genetic cross, I need to take the heterozygous flies and cross them in order to end up with a homozygous small b. So you get two marks for that one and two marks for that one. Although this new allele was recessive, the mutation only occurred once, a large proportion of the fly population ended up being green. So just in terms of natural selection, why the recessive b allele was able to spread so quickly through the population. So natural selection is all about the idea that, um, that a, a, a characteristic that is beneficial will mean that those organisms will survive and pass on that gene. So therefore, it must be that green is advantageous. So for example, camouflage is 
you might have written something about camouflage hope you can spell it um, and therefore more of the green flies will survive to breed and therefore pass on the genes to the next generation question eight <coughs> one of Mendel's original experiments was to cross pure breeding red flowering pea plants with pure breeding white pea plants so if I've got pure breeding red, pure breeding white, so the next year he grew the seed. The first generation of pea plants all have red flowers, so red is dominant. So R R pure breeding white recessive. He made each flower on the plant self pollinate. So he then collected the seed from those flowers and grew them, and he got um, what looks to me like about a three to one ratio of red to white which white which flower color is due to the recessive allele well we already worked that out from the beginning there white draw a genetic diagram show the inheritance of flower color in the first generation of plants use little r and big r and oh, that's lucky because that's what i did to represent them so the first generation they said we cross pure breeding red with pure breeding white so therefore for one mark i've got the correct um parents and for another mark i've got the correct children for the second third mark i need to point out that they would all be red explain why mendel made the first generation self-pollinate if you don't self-pollinate them, then they could have been pollinated by any other colour of flower or any other flower in the field. <coughs> by self-pollinating, he was making sure that they were only pollinated by um, the same genes as, as the ones they got, so that he could then find out if they had any of the white gene in there, if it ended up producing any white flowers. So it was to prevent other genes getting into the mix or so they couldn't breed with other flowers oh my writing's terrible of different colors um or to see if they had the gene for white flowers or to see if he got any white flowers any of those would be worth the mark if mendel had taken any two of his white flowering peas and crossed them what would have been the colours of the flowers of the next generation? So white we know is recessive, so therefore any of those white flowers must have two little r's, so the next generation could only be white because they would only have white alleles. It's very difficult to get red flowering pea plants that breed true. Explain why you cannot guarantee to breed by self-pollination pea plants that only have red flowers well we know that if we have um red is dominant so that means that you you can't see if it has the white gene um it could be heterozygous is another way of saying that so I need red is dominant. I need something to say that it could be heterozygous. Or also, I could say if the white allele was present, I would get a white flower if it was um, if it was if there were two present. So if there was one of them present, sorry, I could end up with a white flower. So if the white gene was present, I could get a white flower so I can't um, I, I, I can't predict whether or not I'll get a white flower because it could be heterozygous I then could end up with a white flower because that white gene could be there but I couldn't I wouldn't see it the use of cloned animals in food production is controversial <coughs> it's now possible to clone champion cows champion cows produce large quantities of milk describe how adult cell cloning could be used to produce a clone of a champion cow well, basically, this is the picture that you had on question one, isn't it? So you're going to get an egg. 
um, and remove the nucleus. So we're just talking through that diagram on question one, really. Um, then take the body cell of my champion cow. I'll insert the nucleus from the body cell into the egg cell. Um, I'll then do an electric shock to start it dividing. So then the cells will divide into an embryo. Oh, embryo, that went wrong. And that embryo is inserted into the womb of another cow. You can see I've got six points there. Any four of those would get you the marks. You don't have to have all six to get the marks. Final question. <coughs> so, we need to read this passage about cloning cattle. So the government's been accused of inexcusable behaviour because a calf of a cloned American champion cow has been born on a British farm. Campaigners say it will undermine the trust in British food because the clone cow's milk could enter the human food chain. But supporters of cloning say that milk from clones and their offspring is safe. And just as safe as the milk that we drink every day. Those in favour of cloning say that an animal clone is a genetic copy. It's not the same as genetically engineered animal. Opponents of clothing say the consumers will be uneasy about drinking milk from cloned animals. So use the information in the passage and your own knowledge and understanding to evaluate whether the government should allow the production of milk from cloned champion cows. So I'm evaluating. Remember to give a conclusion. So give me a little clue there where my marks are coming from. So remember, and if I'm evaluating, that's pros and cons. That's um, advantages and disadvantages. I've only got five marks here, so I'm going to split it between pros and cons and then my conclusion. And if I'm going to get five marks, I'm going to need four pros and cons, aren't I? So I could do three of one, one of the other, or two of each, depending on where I think my strongest arguments are. But I want four marks from the beginning bit and one mark for my conclusion. Probably the easiest way to show you this is just to put the mark scheme under. So therefore it says here, <coughs> you can get a maximum of three marks for the pros, three marks for the cons as a maximum, and then a mark at the end for the conclusion. So as my pros, and I can have any four from this. Um, economic benefit, so an increased yield, more profit. The clone calf is not genetically engineered. So we didn't actually go in and change the genes in a way that we're not really sure what would happen. It's not the same as genetic engineering. The genetic material wasn't altered. The milk safe to drink is the same as ordinary milk. Or cons, consumer resistance caused by misunderstanding the process. It's not been proved that the milk is safe. You can't just say something like God wouldn't like it. It's not natural. You need to say there are ethical and religious arguments. Use those terms to get your marks. Um, also, of course, if you do clone, you're reducing the gene pool because you haven't got sexual reproduction, so you don't have the variation. And your conclusion can be either for or against, just as long as you back it up with some information from the passage or your own knowledge. And the conclusion should be at the end and just be a simple sentence saying, therefore, overall, I believe that, um, that the government should allow production of milk from clone champion cows because it would be economically beneficial and the milk is completely safe. Something like that to, to um, conclude. Okay, I hope that was useful and made sense. And I will set you another set of exam questions to do. And again, like I say, please do use books or whatever to, to answer the questions. And then the day after, I'll do another one for, for you to mark those questions. Hope you're finding this useful and I will speak to you in two days. Bye.